Hey guys, okay, so we are going to cov cover some basics of, of research methods in psychology. This is an introductory course and chapter one. So because this is an introductory psychology course and we're just talking about the basics, we're just we're not going to get into super detail, but we will talk about some of the terms that are used in uh, in psychology and in science. So um, uh, on many of these slides, you'll see uh, there's at least two full slides of definitions. Now, we have gone over some of these terms, but I want to kind of reiterate some of these things. For example, we talked about replication, which is very important, that if you want a study, uh, a research study, to have validation, you want to make sure that you repeat the study with the same parameters uh, so that we can be very sure that that particular study is in, in actually giving us real in, in factual results. If we don't replicate the study, then we don't really have much confidence in how valid that uh, those original findings are. So it's very important. We talked about this in terms of the vaccination debate of vaccines causing autism. And uh, Andrew Wakefield, who uh, had his original study, published saying that vaccines do cause autism. Well, many researchers tried to replicate this or duplicate this study. And after uh, you know hundreds of scientists attempt this, no uh, studies were able to provide the same results. And so when uh, the attempts for replication were, uh, were done and they found that they couldn't find the same result, then you go back to the original study and say, okay, maybe something's wrong here. And it was at that point that, that it was realized that Andrew Wakefield was dishonest in his results. And of course, um, we haven't been able to, to duplicate those findings. So <clears throat> that taught us that maybe something was wrong there. And in the case of the vaccines cause autism debate, uh, we found that that data were actually made up and um, that that was <clears throat> in fact a false study. Um, and so it, sometimes we do make mistakes that are honest mistakes. Um, and sometimes we make mistakes that are intentional um, and, you know, those, those individuals are actually being malicious. Um, but we won't know what's true and what's not until we do re repeated studies. We talked about a theory, which is a step up, of course, from a hypothesis. A hypothesis being basically a prediction, um, a guess, a, a, you know, an answer to a problem that is based off of maybe observation or you know, just kind of uh, what we think might happen. Whereas a theory is actually rooted in um, findings and, and actually has evidence to support it. It's, it's a tentative explanation, um, but it does integrate actual findings and observations that have been um, collected. Um, and then finally here, descriptive, we're gonna talk about descriptive research methods in this uh, lecture series, um, but uh, that's basically not, it's not gonna show us cause causal uh, relationships, so causality. We can't say that we run a descriptive study and, it, and then we can say A causes B. We can only say, you know, this is a description of what the data look like. So for example, we could do an epidemiological study where we test how many people have diabetes and we can give the averages and, you know, we can describe relationships and describe you know, uh, you know, the occurrence of something, but it does not allow us to actually give a, a, a causality. So we can't say that A causes B, we can only say that this is something that is uh, you know, described uh, on how we do it with statistics. Now, and to remind you that a theory is a step up from a hypothesis, it's this tentative explanation, and you know, when we're trying to, to understand um, psychology, we're trying to understand um, you know, what's going on in, in science, we really always must be a critical thinker. Now, I, there's, there's a difference between being so skeptical that you believe nothing in science, and then there's a good sort of healthy skepticism, which we refer to more as critical thinking, where we really think about alternative explanations and think about you know, what could actually be happening um, instead of what we kind of see on the surface. And so I've used this example before in, in other classes about polls. So when, you know, you, you're going and you're watching a particular news channel, 
we know that certain news channels are politically driven. And so if you're watching a poll that's being taken, for example, it's election season and they say, well, we polled all of our viewers and we X amount of people think that this person's going to be president. Well, if the you know, news channel is conservative, then you're going to have more conservative viewers. If the news channel is more liberal or more democratic, you're going to see more, you know, more viewers um, along that route. And then also, you know, you have to think about, so when are they polling people? Let's say it's 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Well, who is able to watch TV at 2 p.m. in the afternoon? So it could be somebody who's older, maybe retired. It could be somebody who doesn't have a job. It could be somebody who works different shifts. Um, and it could be somebody under 18. Um, you know, so we have to think about, of course, who is, who is being polled and is that sample biased? And so, um, you know, we have to always be very cautious when looking at polls. Um, and then also looking usually at the bottom of the screen, they'll give you what's called a margin of error, which tells us, you know, how about how many give or take uh, points will this, you know, is this in terms of error? And a lot of times, you know, you may say 60% of people say this and 40% of people say this, but if you have a 15% margin of error, that could sway the poll either way. And so we have to be really careful about what we see and what we read. And even statistics can be very tricky in the sense that if you know how to use them properly, you can kind of make them say whatever you want them to say. So you must always be a critical thinker when looking at science and also to be able to identify pseudoscience, which is essentially fake science. Um, it's, it's something that sounds good and sounds like science, but isn't actually the case. And so here I've got some really good. Uh, strategies or red flags that we can use to identify pseudoscience and sometimes we get you know sometimes we get um, you know misled um, and it sounds good but when you really look deep down you find that it's actually not the case and what example I'm going to use here is um, the bio uh, so the magnetic therapy bands so a lot of people might have seen these you can wear them as bracelets um, and so it's, it has at some point become a fad to wear the magnetic therapy bracelets. And so I'm going to use that as an example of, of pseudoscience of where we don't really have a lot of evidence to show that is actually something that um, works. So you might see a commercial come on and a lot of times you see things like testimonials. And so if you don't see a whole lot of scientific evidence where they're running studies and they're showing you hard facts and hard data, what you might find instead are testimonials. Somebody coming on and say, oh, well, I, I wore my band and it was really great and it helped me and I love it and I wear it all the time. And so when somebody's just telling you how they feel about it and you know, giving you a testimonial or a before and after picture, you know, that, can be, that, that can be a major red flag that perhaps you're dealing with pseudoscience and something that's not actually rooted in science. We don't know if, if you know, a person was actually doing something. So for example, maybe they had a medical condition and they say that it was cleared up by this magnetic bracelet. Well, we don't know if they changed their diet, started exercising, started taking medication, along with wearing that bracelet. That could actually be um, explaining why they actually feel better. Another red flag that you can find with pseudoscience is that you see this scientific jargon, really high, hyper-technical language, right, where they're using real science terminology, but they're abusing it. So for example, they may use the term energy, frequency, vibration, quantum, but they may not actually be using it either in the right sense or the right substance. And so we can see, you know, that really, even though you can have a really hyper-technical language, it doesn't necessarily mean it contains, you know, scientific substance. So you might, you know, say that the, the magnetic therapy bands uh, restore your biomagnetic balance. Well, biomagnetic balance doesn't really mean anything. And there's not really a way to test that. Um, there's not really, it's, it's very difficult to actually even define what it is they mean by that. Another thing is uh, combining actual science with unfounded claims um, in, 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 in pseudoscience. So, you know, when we look at real science, Earth does have a magnetic field. Check. Uh, you know, uh, blood does contain irons and iron and minerals. Check, but what what what's important that that you know they they either leave to you to kind of put together or they actually falsely say 
um, you know, the red blood cells that you have, um, you know, th there's iron in your red blood cells, but those are not, they're not actually attracted to magnets in the same sense that, that you would think, um, you know, that, that would work for a magnetic bracelet. So that, because the iron in red blood cells isn't, isn't magnetic, um, or not attracted to, to, you know, to magnets, it's not going to affect, you know, your blood flow. And so this idea that, you know, you're combining real science with, with, you know, sort of fake information, um, can be, can, can really throw people off. Um, another thing is using irrefutable or non-falsifiable claims in the sense that you, you know, there's no way that you can actually test stuff. Um, so, you know, if you say, for example, that magnetic therapy uh, uh, restores the natural magnetic balance, which is required by your he body's healing process, that's not something that you can actually test. You know, these are claims that are, that are made that, that you can't falsify. Um, and so that means that if you can't test it, then you can't show evidence for it being right or wrong. Um, another thing is confirmation bias. And so we see confirmation bias when you see anything that's even remotely like uh, a, a, an actual real result. And so we see this a lot of times, and, and we talked about the vaccination debate. You know, somebody might say, well, there was that one study that said that vaccines cause, you know, autism. And, and, and what it is essentially, it's a, con it's a confirmation bias. You, you are looking for this one single study to confirm um, what it is that you're saying, but you ignore the thousands of other studies that essentially undermine, contradict, or deny that what you're what you're saying is true. Um, and so, ignoring all of the you know mountains of evidence and just looking for one little tiny thing to confirm is is where you see confirmation bias coming in. Another thing is shifting the burden of proof, which is essentially that uh, you know will then prove to me that it it doesn't work. Um, and you know, that doesn't, that's not really how it works. You know, if you're making the claim, then you should show that it works. If you're saying that, you know, mag magnet bands, um, you know, are supposed to, uh, you know, make you feel better, then that's on you to, to actually show that it's not on me to say that they don't make you feel better. So that shifting a, a burden of proof can be, um, a major red flag. And then finally, which is one of my favorites is the multiple outs. And that is, if it does fail, um, you know, companies have uh, already um, figured out uh, ways for, for them to explain why it failed that really, you know, is, is not really an explanation at all. So they may say, for example, with the magnetic bracelets, if you say, well, I wore it for a year um, and, it didn't, and it didn't do anything, um, you know, someone might say, well, you didn't wear it long enough. Maybe you need to wear five years. Um, you know, they may say that magnets act differently on different body parts. Maybe you need to wear two of them. Um, maybe you put it in the wrong spot. Maybe, uh, the magnets were the wrong type, shape, size, color, whatever. And, uh, and that doesn't work for you. And so, um, you know, these are definitely strategies that, that you can use to kind of identify, um, what is, uh, pseudoscience, fake science, and what is real science. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this series up into several different videos, and uh, that makes it a little bit more manageable. Um, and the next thing I'm going to cover is types of research strategies. We're going to cover descriptive and experimental strategies. So just stay tuned and, and move to the next video um, to get the rest of chapter one.